welcome to We Are DB. I'm Danielle, joined by Brenton. Hi there, everyone. Thanks for joining us for our honorable mention episode this month, as we take the opportunity to talk about a great film that just missed out on being on the IMDb's list of the best movies of all time. This month, rated at 8.0 on the Internet Movie Database by millions of film lovers from around the world, is Rain Man. Released in 1988, starring Dustin Hoffman and Tom Cruise as the two leads, Rain Man is a road trip drama, set mostly while driving from Cincinnati, Ohio to Los Angeles, California. This film is an original screenplay by Barry Morrow, uh, for which he won the Oscar, and is directed by Barry Levinson, who also won the Oscar. It was nominated for eight Academy Awards total, winning four, including Best Picture that year. So if this movie had won a Best Actress title as well, it would have got the top five, because it got screenplay, picture, actor, and director, which is pretty impressive. And that's why I'm kind of surprised that it's not on the top 250, because I actually really like this movie. I do too, and I think it's a really important movie. And it had it had really great acting on both their parts, like for Dustin Hoffman to carry that off so well and play it so convincingly and accurately, I think was really important for the film to make the statement that it did. And it's also quite impressive that he was able to commit to that sort of character so thoroughly and convincingly. This is a movie about a young man who finds out he has a brother who is autistic. So Charlie, Tom Cruise's character, has gone his whole life thinking he was an only child, and then he very quickly finds out that he has a brother and that his brother has special needs, who is Raymond. Uh, And this whole movie is kind of them interacting for the first time, Charlie learning what it's like to interact with someone who has autism because he's never even really heard of it before. Because Charlie, Tom Cruise's character, has to get back to Los Angeles as soon as possible, and he takes his brother, Raymond, on this road trip, and the entire rest of the movie is pretty much this interaction between the two of them going through the Midwest. So Dustin Hoffman won the... Oscar for Best Actor for this, for depicting an autistic savant. And I think it was totally, totally deserved. The The other film I really want to see for a similar performance is, what is it, What's Eating Gilbert Grape? Oh, yeah, for Leo DiCaprio. With Leo DiCaprio, yeah. My nan goes on about that movie all the time. She was so impressed by his performance. I really want to see it. It's pretty much the only good part of that, that movie is his performance. The rest of it's pretty mm. boring. Um, that was his first Oscar nomination when he was 18. Mm-hmm. That's crazy. The reason Hoffman was so good at portraying an autistic savant is because he worked with them for a year in preparation for this film. So, okay. And when he was uh, just starting out as an actor, um, as a part-time job, he would work as a carer. Oh, really? So he's worked around quite a lot of these people before, and he's picked up on a lot of their traits with their repetitiveness and what makes them more comfortable and what makes them tick. And I actually think that this is one of Tom Cruise's best movies. I've seen him in quite a lot, and he's been nominated for Oscars three times, and he hasn't won. Um, But I think this is personally my favorite performance from Tom Cruise. And I think it gets overlooked because of how great Dustin Hoffman is is in it. Yeah. Which is a shame, because I really like just watching both of the actors for two different reasons, and I think they're just both at the top of their game. Mm Mm-hmm. I've got... A cue, like a kind of scale that I very unconsciously in rating performance. And if a character really makes me angry, that actor is doing a great job. You know what I mean? That's that's not bad. That's good. That happened a lot. And I mean, I think for people who have never listened to our podcast before, I am doing training in community services and mental health. So for me, working with vulnerable people really hits home. So there's been a few different instances in movies that we've watched from like, you just can't do that. (laughs) You know what I mean? So I really, that's part of why it was. um, It was more sensitive to you. Yeah, that's part of why it got me riled up. That said, it still rings true for a lot of people. You know what I mean? Yeah, just to 
reiterate from Monday's episode, One Floor Over the Cuckoo's Nest, we mentioned that Danielle has a diploma in mental health, so she has more of an insight into these sort of mental health issues than, than most. And as I was saying in that episode that it's interesting that we did both of these very good movies on mental health in America's Mental Health Awareness Month. Because May is Mental Health Month in America, and we just happen to do these two movies. Yeah. Two very important movies that, that shows two different sides of mental health issues and trying to live with them. Yeah, and that's why I think these are both such important movies, because one really, like last week's One Flow Over the Cuckoo's Nest, really highlighted how far we've come. Because to a certain extent, honestly, some some people still really are very ignorant about different conditions and the way they should be managed and handled so this one really shows how you can change and how you need to adapt to work with someone who's got a condition and i thought it conveyed that really well so going on from the fact that tom cruise's character really pissed you off i think i think the point of his character is to represent the general ignorant public when it comes to mental health particularly in 1988 when this came out a lot of people even today let alone in the 80s, didn't know how to deal with people with mental health or mental health issues. There's a stigmatization around the whole thing, um, particularly with autism, this extreme. The thing that I saw as really quite accurate, I thought it was really quite coincidental. I've been doing a lot of personal research on autism, and I've been watching a lot of Fathering Autism YouTube channel which is just a vlog that follows the life of this family whose daughter has severe autism and she's nonverbal. Um, and what I thought was really quite accurate about his characterization of Raymond is the way he would have his outbursts, the verbalization he would enact in his outbursts, I think was really very accurate to what uh, an outburst would be like for a true autistic person. And the thing to with Raymond as is highlighted a couple times in the movie is that he's actually very high functioning. I think yeah. that terminology is coming out of use a little bit and just saying really he's high functioning so he needs lower levels of support but he still needs quite a high level of support. So my point being that there are many many worse cases of autism like as far as autism goes he's actually pretty good. You know what I mean? So I think movies like this are really important so that there's some visualization in the media of what conditions look like. And I think it's really important that they're accurate, which I think this one was quite. I'd love to hear this opinion from somebody who actually has a relative who's autistic or is a carer for someone who's autistic, just to see how, exactly how accurate it is. But from my understanding, I think it is quite representative of what uh, living and working with someone who has autism would be like. Yeah, there's quite a few scenes in this where Tom Cruise basically doesn't accept that autism is even a thing. He's like, just snap out of it. Stop being an idiot. Stop acting like a retard. Like, I think this is all a show. He just didn't understand what's going at all. He doesn't know how to handle any of the situations. That's the thing is because he doesn't even understand... Ray doesn't understand what the concept of being an idiot is. He does I don't think that's the problem of the scene. No, I know, but it's just like on the very basic level, like you're you're asking him to think in a way that he just can't do. You know what I mean? It's like you're yeah. asking a chicken to lay chocolate eggs or something. You know what I mean? Like it's just it's not going to happen. He doesn't even know what chocolate is. Yeah, exactly. Like it's on a bunch of levels there's a lack of education and understanding there which i think by the end of the movie he's grown a lot of patience and empathy which is really he's, he's got a lot more understanding after a week yeah and it's that's really the basis of working with anybody who's got a condition is that you have to have patience and you have to be willing to kind of think about how things would be for them and if you can't then even take that on as, oh, wow, like, I can't even imagine not being able to understand the way I understand, and then using that as your basis to build empathy. You know what I mean? Because there's even the, the recurring joke in there where he keeps reciting Abbott and Costello's Who's On First, their skit. And Charlie says a couple of times, if you realize that it's meant to be funny, maybe you'll get better. And that's, that's not how mental health works. 
I mean, like he that's just, not how autism works. Well, yeah. If you realize that it's meant to be a joke, you'll just get over it. Like, yeah. it's not like getting over a sickness. Yeah. Well, and I just want to point out, I don't think autism is really a mental health condition so much as it is a cognitive condition. Because it affects the way you think and the way you understand things, which mental health conditions can do, but they're not quite the same umbrella. But yeah, I get what you're saying. We're going on a bit of a tangent here, just purely about autism and uh, savantism, but I think that that's sort of necessary and inevitable for a movie like this, so just bear with us before we get back to the movie. I think it's an important discussion to talk about these things. And it's interesting that you said before that it's good that the media has this big portrayal of autism in this way, in an accurate way, that got so much praise that it won Best Picture, because it puts that image of what is that in people's minds. Well, exactly, because that's what One Flew Over the Cuckoo's Nest did, which was a good thing, but it was also a bad thing, because that is the go-to that people think that mental health wards and psych wards are like now, and they're not like that anymore. You know what I yeah, mean? Yeah, but the point of that movie was to highlight how bad the system was and how bad everyone was being treated. But I think I it don't got think it was spun- meant to be a little bit different because I know like it's been brought up in my classes many times where it's like what do you think of when you think of a psych ward one flow of the cuckoo's nest it's not like that yeah. anymore you know yeah. so like it's important to have accurate portrayals in media and entertainment is basically what I'm saying because we watched that episode of the Simpsons last night where Homer goes to the mental institute and he basically gets sent to the exact same institute that Nicholson does in One Flu, right? Shot it's a whole, for the shot. whole movie. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, the whole uh, episode is just a parody. Um, so that again leads to why One Flu is my perception, is because that scene has been parodied. So therefore, a lot of different pop cultural things will pull from that exact same one moment. Well, see, and that's the issue is that it wasn't One Flu, it's that it was such a success that, like, The Simpsons pulled from it for the purpose of a joke. Yeah. But. Which is fine, like, I'm not slamming humor, I'm just saying we need to have education and accurate representations. Like, when we were watching another show where they had an autistic savant on there, and I said, what is that? What, what is- I, under- I kind of understand what autism is, right? But I don't understand what savantism is, I've never heard of that one before. And you literally just said, think of Rain Man. And yeah. I'm like, oh, okay, cool, I got it, just like that. Yeah. Um, so that's good to have that in the back of your mind as an accurate representation to pull from at any point. Yes. Savantism is a characteristic. High functioning. You don't even have to be high functioning. It's a characteristic of some autistic people who are able to have gifted abilities, but they're severely lacking in other areas of cognition in life. I actually think a very good explanation of this is the scene where Charlie takes him to the doctor. And the doctor gives him these crazy multiplications and he puts it on the exactly. calculator. And he's like, this is amazing. He's a genius. And then he says, if I had a dollar and I took away 50 cents, how much would I have? And he, he says 70 cents. He, he doesn't understand things that you and I would get, get fine. Yeah, he doesn't understand the concept of money. Yeah, because then he says, how much is a candy bar? It's $100. He doesn't understand the basic things that you and I. So it looks like he's a genius, even though all of that thought pressure is concentrated to one stream of thought and it's lacking in a lot of others if that makes sense well and the reason that happens with autistic people as again is explained really quite well in the movie their input into their brain which is then processed into thought is different they see the world through a different filter and their sensory input is processed differently than other people so like raymond he can see the toothpicks on the floor And he can automatically know how many toothpicks there are there, right? So there's something like that. There was the... It was on... Was it on Minefield that we saw the other man? Yeah, Vsauce. Yeah, okay, Vsauce. Um, Where Michael went and he saw this man who was an autistic savant and music prodigy. So he could, you know, play back up to, I think, 18 notes. But he wouldn't be able to tell you how many notes he played. But he could do it. Like, he could play anything by ear. He could hear it and then automatically play it back on the piano. And he was, like, trained to be able to do that. But the ability was there. His therapist recognized it in him and helped grow that because that's how his brain worked to communicate. 
right? So that he can't necessarily take care of himself. He can't necessarily converse and interact the same way that other people do, but he's amazingly talented when it comes to the piano. Raymond's amazingly talented when it comes to mathematics, patterns, and memory, but he can't do other things that other people can do. And that's basically, like, that's savantism, but that's basically what autism is as well, is it's just that you're seeing and interpreting the world through a different filter. So you see a couple scenes in the movie, too, where he starts to hit his head because he's he's having... I would almost say that's an autistic meltdown, but I'll go with tantrum just for the purposes because I'm not sure. And that's happening because he's getting too much sensory input at the same time and it's overwhelming to his system. Well, I think that's depicted really quite well in the film because there's a lot of times where there's too much noise, there's too many lights, there's too much going on, there's too many people around and he doesn't know how to handle it. And I really quite like the movie for the way that that's depicted. It's just too much going on and I'm... I think that that must be how these people feel in those moments. And it's a mm-hmm. good representation for people who didn't really understand that that was a thing. And to go into terminology a little bit more based on what you just said, an autistic tantrum, it's a behavioral tantrum like like most kids would have. Um, but a meltdown comes from losing control of a situation. And that's how autistic people generally express themselves is because they don't know how to communicate the same way that other people do so that's how they express their distress basically so when you see in the smoke alarm scene ray is totally overwhelmed he's scared he can't get the door open he's lost control so that's how he expresses that he's in distress which honestly in that situation i'd be a little bit distressed too if i couldn't figure out any of that stuff you know So there's just a little bit of education there for you on autism and savantism. Interestingly, as well, this opened a really cool conversation for Brenton and I because Brenton is actually on the autism spectrum. I mean, I don't think it's too difficult to be on the spectrum. It is definitely mild autism. I'm not I'm not a savant or anything, but I am on the spectrum. Well, and I think this is a really important thing to bring up to. Okay, I'm going to go back into diagnostics a little bit. Okay. Because you were actually diagnosed with Asperger's syndrome. That was probably one of the traits. I have a number of traits that are listed sort of under autism. And that was one of the first ones that I was diagnosed with. Because of my lack of social skills and things when I was a child. Mm -hmm. I just want to go into now, um, as of the DSM-5, so that's Psychology's Diagnostic Statistical Manual of Mental Health Symptoms and Disorders, basically. It's the book when it comes to diagnosing any sort of psychiatric or cognitive disabilities and conditions. So the DSM-5 took Asperger's syndrome and autism and combined them into one thing that is now called autism spectrum disorder. And there's various levels. I think level one is the lowest and it goes up. Makes sense. Yeah, based on like levels one to three. Level one being you, basically, and that would kind of encompass some of the symptoms of Asperger's syndrome. Because the thing is, autism is not cut and dry. Like, if you made a a graph of different symptoms that a person can have, she said it wouldn't be one-dimensional, it would be about three-dimensional. Because it's like, do you have this trait? How significant is it to you? Does it impact on your ability to communicate? Does it impact on your functionality in life? So the thing is, like, in the past, you may have had symptoms that could fall into both categories, but they more closely aligned with Asperger's, and that's why you were diagnosed with it. But now it's considered just high-functioning, low-severity autism spectrum disorder. And the point is that, like, you don't have to be Rain Man to have autism. A lot of people, you wouldn't even know that they have autism. Yes. That's why I said it's not difficult to be on the spectrum. A lot of people can be on the low end of the spectrum and still be there. You know, both of my sisters are. My dad well, We is. were even just talking about it and I'm, I was saying to you, I wonder if I am just because... You have some traits. I have some traits that are more significant than than they would be. And this isn't a thing about like saying, oh, like I like to line up my pencils. I have OCD because that's not what OCD is. Like, I'm curious to find out if if I may be on the spectrum because I have a few traits that are significant enough to warrant me going, hmm, I wonder. But let's talk about the traits that you have. 
just so that people can have an understanding of what this can actually look like. Well, when I was younger, this was definitely a, a, more of an issue when I was a kid. Um, but I definitely about had traits how old of a. Do you think? I think I sort of tried to teach myself out of it when in my late teens. Mm -hmm. But before that, I definitely had more traits of obsessive compulsive disorder, um, mm -hmm. and just the things that they would make me uncomfortable if I didn't do them, or mm -hmm. if they things weren't in a certain order. Like I had to do things a number of times in order to make myself comfortable. And essentially, I just told myself, I don't need to do that. I don't need to do it. And I, I essentially taught myself out of it. I definitely still, there's traits there, but it's definitely less severe. It's so mild. It's so mild. I just like to order my DVDs in alphabetical order. Well, and I think something to note too is that that used to be more of an issue for you. Yes. Um. So the fact that, oh, you don't do that anymore, you're cured. That's not that's No, not that's what I was saying. Conditions... It's definitely still yeah. there, but yeah. um, it doesn't in fact my life at all well and the fact that you can kind of teach yourself how to cope better with those traits that you have not everybody can do that either even people who are at the same level of symptomology that you have there are other people who couldn't do that for themselves so i mean you can't generalize ever with these kind of conditions another thing was um photographic memory I can generally... See, when people say photographic memory, you think that you can take a photo in your mind, and then no one has a perfect photographic memory. It's, um... what What's the actual name for it? It's like identity... Identic. Identic I memory. Identic memory. That's essentially what it is, right? If you tell me, focus on this, take a photo of it, I could look at it for about five seconds and blink my eyes a couple of times, and it's in there. And I can pull on it whenever I want. But I need to... I need to consciously take the photo. I can't just, like, recall what happened six days ago down the street. You know what I mean? Yeah. Um, so I was very good in math class for because I could just remember the formulas and stuff because I would just take a photo. Um, You've told me, too, that if you take it, it's not there forever. You have to actively exercise yeah. using that photo. Just like any memory. Yeah. So it's like if you took a photo from, like, your fifth birthday or whatever, you're not just going to automatically remember it unless you recall it often like but it's not it in was interesting forever. that i have earlier memories than most people generally do yeah that is really interesting i was talking with my mom just last christmas when i saw her last uh and i was recalling certain things that happened when i was a child and she's like how on earth do you remember that like you were you were two prop. i'd only just turned two some of the things that i had said i'd just turned two and she's like that's that's odd that's bizarre behavior and i was like man was that really like i remember most of the 90s and that's weird because i'm a 90s kid um, well you were born in what 93 yeah but i remember from 95 onwards that's that's strange yeah <laughs> it is a little strange whereas i don't and i don't remember the 90s at all like most of my memories come in from 2000 when I was onwards. about five yeah which is normal for most people. So another thing was, like, when I was at school, one of the teachers said, I'll give a carton of Coke to the first kid who can remember the first 20 elements on the periodic table. Mm -hmm. So I just, I remember sitting in there in, like, homeroom class, and I just, we had a periodic table, and I just took a photo of it. And uh, the next day we came to class in the morning, and I would remembered it just by staring at it for five minutes. Um, and I think I did, ended up doing up to 40 just because I could, you know what I mean? Like, I might, mm -hmm. I might as well just read off what the photo says, you know what I mean? Um, mm -hmm. And also, kids would, like, think it was cool, so they're, like, they dared me to to see how many places of pie I could remember. And I looked at that for, for 10 minutes or so, and I could get up to, like, 80, 80 or 90 places of pie, just because I can I can remember it just by reading the image in my mind. Mm -hmm. um, so it's, it's a little confusing to people who can't understand how the ability works. And especially mm -hmm. with another one of my traits is synesthesia. Um, Explain what that is. It's so Now, cool. generally, synesthesia is the mixing of senses. So if you mm -hmm. see the color pink, you might taste lemons or something. You know what I mean? Like if you hear a particular high-pitched sound, you might mind you of a certain thing. It's a mixing like of a senses. Color. Yeah. Uh, yeah. So if you hear like a high-pitched squeal, you might see the color yellow. It's, it's really weird to describe to some people. I don't think that I have that type of synesthesia. The most common type is color grapheme synesthesia, where you assign personal traits, colors, genders, and personalities to characters, like 
like numbers and letters mostly. So I do it for words. Some people do it for people. I've met someone who's like, oh, you know, Gary is a purple person. You know what I mean? And you Mm. think of purple when you think of that person, right? Mm -hmm. I do it mostly for words and numbers. Um, So I can think of days of the week in colors. Uh, It's formed around your development stages when you're very first learning what is a letter, what is a number. The letter E for me is green because there's two of them in the word green. Mm-hmm. The letter P is purple because there's two of them in the word purple. And that doesn't always make sense, um, but that's how I can understand that I developed that for that particular letter. Um, mm-hmm. I'm not really sure, but every single letter has a particular color associated to it. They, I can tell you their personalities, and I can definitely tell you their sexes. Mm-hmm. Everyone's either a male or a female. It's It's just interesting. That's the type of synesthesia that I have, and people find that probably the most interesting they don't understand like okay how does that work more than anything else i feel like they're just like fuck off you're full of yeah. crap yeah some you people know? are like yeah i don't i don't get it or i don't i don't believe you yeah yeah i remember when you first told me about this i was like no way because i'd just been learning it. about it in my biology class so that was really cool because i was able to use you as a learning resource pretty much didn't you say <laughs> to like, with the months, you assign different lengths to them? Yeah, but I, I think a lot of people do that. Like, the six months during, let's say, March to September is mm-hmm. much shorter than from September to March over mm-hmm. over the Christmas break. It's just that seems like the longest part of the year for me, even though it's probably the same amount of time. I, I think a lot of people do that, though. It's it, Time is distorted. It, time is completely relative. I'm not mm-hmm. sure if that's a trade of the synesthesia, though. Adding on from that is just having a good memory in general, but I think yep. that that's a, that's a trait of that. Uh, an interesting thing that I saw Dustin Hoffman doing in this movie is making sounds. Like repeating sounds that he hears. Yeah, impersonate sounds that he's hearing. And I, mm. I'm like, I absolutely would do that. Like, I even do that now just because it's fun. But mm-hmm. if I heard, like, a construction noise or something, I would, like, try and repeat it. Um, oh, my God. I just realized... You are so good at voices. You're so yes, good at- Yes, I was going to say that. I'm good at yeah. impersonations because I'm just literally copying the sound. Yeah. And I can remember the sound a little bit better. I'm very good at drawing because I can just take a photo of it and put the drawing on the paper and just trace over it. You know what I mean? Like, there's, yeah. no, there's no image there. And it's interesting because Charlie Babbitt, Tom Cruise, says, mm-hmm. how did you do that? When he asks Rain Man and he's like, I can see it. I can see it. And I'm like, that's absolutely how- I'm able to draw because I like take a photo. I can visualize what is the design that I'm doing. What am I drawing? And I'll just draw over it. You know what I mean? And I can, yeah. I can visualize it better. And it was interesting that he said, I can see it. Cause I'm like, Oh, that's absolutely how I, how I managed to visualize things best. Mm-hmm. Were there any other traits? I also picked up that he's very literal. Like when he's walking across the oh, street, it says God. walk, walk, and then I just you are so literal. Not in the, not in that same way, but finish what you're saying. And then it just says don't walk, and he just stops because he's very literal. And obviously, I'm not that bad, but definitely when I was a kid, I was a lot more literal. Where you mm-hmm. just like, and people don't understand that again because they're just like, why can't you just think like a normal person? And I'm like, well. This thing told me to do this, so I'm going to do it to its full extent. You know what I mean? Like, yeah. I didn't have that extra input in my thought process. And again, it is difficult. Even with my mildness, people don't understand it. They're like, you're, you're weird. That's where a lot of the social interaction deficiencies come from for people who have autism. Because they don't understand the nuances and subtleties of interacting. Because they are very literal people. And so that's where that, oh, you're weird, comes from is because, well, no, I'm not. I'm just doing it the way it's it's said to, right? Well, right at the beginning, Tom Cruise, so he turns to Raymond and he's like, I'll just wait there a sec. I've got to talk to Susanna. So you see Raymond in the background. He waits one second and then he leaves. Yeah. It's very literal. Like, he's just like, okay, I've done what you asked me to do. Yeah. And he doesn't get that. that that's what I mean by he's literal. And that's what I, similar stuff to that when I was a kid, I was more... Like I said, the traits are still there, but it's it's less severe than, than when I was younger. Mm. Anyway, back to the movie. Um, <laughs> <laughs> the scene where he is in the doctor's surgery and he does do that demonstration of what 
how these people think. I really think that's an important turning point for Tom Cruise's character Mm -hmm. because that's when he's like, oh, this is a real thing and that's how he thinks. And it's not too long after that where he realizes that he could use it to his advantage. Um, Obviously, that's not his immediate thought because they drive quite a fair way down the road. They go through Vegas and it's only after he loses all that money with the cars is that that he thinks that he can try and make a profit out of it. But I think that scene is a big turning point in that character because he realizes actually what this is and how his thought process is more so than he ever had. And I think he also starts to cut him some more slack and you start to see him be more patient because at the beginning, he's like, why do you got to put the bed by the window? Why do you have to, you know what I mean? And he's like, look, we got your shoes at the end of the bed the way you like it. We got your bed by the window. We got your apple juice and your pens on the table facing the TV. You know what I mean? He He's more willing from that point on to do what Raymond needs because now he understands that he actually needs it. You know what I mean? He acts a lot like a harsh dad at the time from the 80s, you know what I mean? He's like, sit down and shut up, I'm going to turn this car around, you know what I mean? Like, that kind of father figure from, like, the 70s and 80s. What about, what's the dad from that 70s show where he's just a hard ass? Red Foreman. Yeah, I just feel like that particular character was very much of, like, fathers of that time. And I think Tom Cruise's character, he's just got no tolerance. He's like, shut up, stop being an idiot, stop acting like a child. Um, Yeah. And I, I don't know, I just feel like that's he's acting older than what he is sort of thing. Yeah. It's interesting that we watched this movie this year because I'm the same age that Tom Cruise was when he filmed this movie. And the actress who played Susanna is the exact same age that you are when... Oh, that's weird. She played the character. And Dustin Hoffman is the same age that my father is this year. That's weird. So... That puts a little bit more perspective for myself because Tom Cruise has a brother who's the same age as my dad. So I can, I can like present it a little bit more. It's like you kissing someone my dad's age. Now that you put that in perspective with the ages. Because when I I watched this when I was a kid, I'm like, oh, Tom Cruise is, he's old, you know, he's probably like in his 30s or something. He's really not. He's in his mid 20s when he filmed this. Um, I thought too they said that Ray was only supposed to be three years older than him. And then even in that picture, you see him like, he looks a lot more than three years older. Did I misunderstand yeah, that? No, they didn't say that. They said that Charlie was three years old when Raymond went to the hospital. Oh, okay. Okay. Yeah, because gotcha. he didn't want to harm the baby. He thought that he was going to harm the baby. Also, going back to that doctor scene, does the nurse not know what autism is? She's like, what's that? What are you talking about? She's like, he's artistic. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> like, how do you... How have you not even heard of it? I know it's 88 or whatever, but... I have no idea how it used to be, but I think it was a lot easier to become a nurse and you didn't need as much training back then as you do now. Yeah. Like, it is full on to be a nurse now. Like, you need a full degree and, well, at least in Canada, you do. Um, To be an enrolled nurse, you need a diploma, but to be a registered nurse, you need a degree. Yeah. Either way, it's a lot of study. You can't just, like, you can't just rock up and... That's Ooh, your, your part-time yeah. job, you know what I mean? Yeah. Yeah. I think it's interesting that when... Because they go on the road trip because they can't fly from Ohio to Los Angeles because Raymond's not comfortable flying because he's seen that it's too dangerous. And he says that he wants to fly Qantas because they haven't had a crash. And that record is still true to today. Qantas oh, is funny. Australia's national airline. Lovely airline, by the way. If you ever want to come to Australia, definitely fly Qantas. Highly you like you like Qantas. <laughs> I love Qantas. <laughs> so that airline's been around since 1920. So they're 100 years old next year. Wow! That's and they nuts. have never they've never crashed a plane and they've never killed anyone, which is like the only airline in the world older than five years old that that has done that. Um, so that record still holds true today. And I was just thinking about it. If they had got on a plane from Cincinnati to Melbourne, Australia, and again from Melbourne to Los Angeles, it would have been quicker and cheaper if he had actually done it. Because in that moment, you're like, yeah, there's no fucking way I'm going all the way to Australia and back again, because that's ridiculous. The amount of time that that would take and the money. But if you look at it in hindsight, it was a lot cheaper than 80 grand that he lost uh, and a lot lot quicker. That's funny. So he could have just done that. (laughs) 
Also, at the beginning of this, I thought it was interesting in the credits that it says the music is by Hans Zimmer. I just thought, yeah. wow, that's that's interesting. Um, he's obviously, we've spoken about him on the Christopher Nolan episodes before. Is he the one who does all the iconic stuff? I was saying to you last night, there's pretty much just like four main people that people go to to get their scores. You know what I mean? Like you always see yeah. them doing the same sort of things over and over again. You're like, oh, this is the same guy as that. Is he the Star Wars Indiana Jones guy? No, that's John Williams. Okay. He was nominated for 11 no- Oscar nominations. He won it for The Lion King. He was nominated for Dunkirk, Interstellar, Inception, Sherlock Holmes, Gladiator, The Thin Red Line, The Prince of Egypt, As Good As It Gets, The Preacher's Wife, and Rain Man. That's quite a diverse range of things over a number of decades. I think that that was interesting that it's Hans Zimmer. I didn't like the score in this. I thought it was just, like, regular. It was weird, like... Very 80s yeah, sort of interesting Vibe. like flutes and stuff that they would use in that time. I think this was his first movie and he hadn't really had his own musical style yet. There's so much from that time period that just sounds like these Native American flutes. That's what I was going to say. And I'm like, it, it sounds like very native. Like that late 80s, early 90s. Like I had to watch a documentary series for my anthropology class last semester. And it was all that music. Like, it sounded just like that, because it was early 90s, and it had the, like, shitty, colorful graphics that you saw all in the 90s and stuff. Like, that now is going to be defining of that time period for me, is that kind of music, now that I made that realization. Did you have anything else to say? Just that most of my notes, and this doesn't surprise me, were reactional. In reaction to uh, Tom Cruise's character and how you didn't like his portrayal. Yes. Well, not the portrayal, but his character. I just didn't like his behavior. I just found it really frustrating. And I think it's because I wouldn't act that way anyway towards people. And I think part of that, too, is because I had an uncle who was diagnosed in the 60s or whenever he was born with mental retardation. So I I just I grew up around people of different abilities. And I just know that that's just not how you treat people especially people who are different from you. So it just, on a base level, I wouldn't do it. On the level that I'm at now, based on my education, it just, it really bothers me. And I I was just, I was happy to see the turnaround that Charlie's character made in terms of becoming more understanding, more empathetic, more patient, more compassionate. And I just think that's where everybody should start. Like, don't go looking at somebody who's different from you and automatically thinking that they're strange or there's something wrong with them. Because there's not. It's just that they're different from you. And everybody has different needs. And just because someone has some needs that give them preferential treatment doesn't mean that they're better than you or that you should have a bee in your bonnet. The thing that I was going to bring up was a that... A bee in your bonnet. Yeah. It doesn't mean you should be upset about it. And there's a program in airports called TSA Cares... And it kind of links to this because it shows like how it would have been for Raymond and why he wouldn't want to fly. But the TSA CARES program, basically what it does is you go to the counter, you say, we need to use this program because we have a child with special needs or a person with special needs, and you'll get a walkthrough through security. And it just shows that like we're definitely taking the steps in society to be able to more be more accommodating to people with diverse needs, but we still got a little ways to go. So this is probably like the th- third or fourth time that I've seen this movie and I I really like it. Like I was looking forward to it mostly because it's not it's not heavy. It, even though it's covering important topics, you you can just chuck it on and it's a nice road trip movie. It's a family relationship drama, you know what I mean? Like it's I really quite like it and I love just watching the actors interact. I like that they were able to make it funny without making it insensitive. It's just, I think they did a really great job with this. Like, it just, it hit all the notes for me. Is it one of my favorite movies? I don't mind watching it. I just, I think it's, for what it was, it's really good. I definitely think it's underrated. I'm not sure why it it's only got an 8.0, or it's not even in the top 250 of the IMDb. Yeah. But that's why we're still giving it a praise now. Well, if anything gets best picture, it should be up there. Yeah. Uh, I'm with you. So, next month's honourable mention will be Brokeback Mountain from 2005, which got a lot of praise and a lot of controversy when it came out in 2005. 
And I've never seen it, so I'm looking forward to seeing it. I'm really interested to have the conversation with you about that movie because we'll have a lot to say about gay representation in the 70s, which is pretty much the main say, topic of that. We're hitting all my passion points with mental Your health interests. and yeah, disability advocacy and LGBTQ advocacy and gender and all sorts of cool stuff. So I'm looking forward to it a lot. So I've seen that movie twice and I, I really enjoy it. And I'm very surprised that it's not in the top 250 because it was nominated for Best Picture. So we'll talk about that more next month. We have been Danielle and Brenton this week. Thanks for joining us. Feel free to subscribe wherever you get your podcasts, check us out on all the socials, and comment on SoundCloud. And until next week, thanks for listening.